Millions of people in the United States lack access to quality health care and suffer disproportionately high rates of infection, medical complications, and even death from serious diseases. These health disparities affect women of color at alarmingly high rates. According to Department of Health and Human Services data, Hispanic women are 40% more likely to be diagnosed with cervical cancer and 30% more likely to die from the disease as compared to non-Hispanic white women. And breast cancer mortality is approximately 40% higher among black women compared with white women. But a program in Florida is trying to change these statistics by removing financial, cultural, and educational barriers so more women gain access to life-saving preventative care, including getting screened for breast and cervical cancers. Their innovative model could be replicated all across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Nancy Brinker, co-founder of the Promise Fund of Florida and Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz of Florida 23rd Congressional District. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really so incredibly important that we have an opportunity here to have this regionally and internationally important discussion because if there is one thing that knows no boundaries, it is the impact of breast cancer on women and, and some men all across the globe. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to, to be here with my dear friend, truly dear friend, Nancy Brinker. And we have an opportunity to talk a little bit about the breadth of the issues surrounding the progress we've made in the fight against breast cancer and how far we still have to go. So I want to actually just get right into it because we have a clock ticking in front of us and I know we're going to both get stressed <laughs> out over how much we want to be able to cover. Talk to me about the Promise Fund. The announcer just um, alluded to it, right. but tell us about what the Promise Fund is. It's certainly not as well known as, as your association with Komen and all the amazing work you did with that incredible organization in memory of you and in honor of your, your dear sister. Um, so tell us what you're doing and I know we can, uh, we can have a dialogue about that. Thank you, Congresswoman Debbie. I want to tell everybody to make sure you know that we are both breast cancer survivors, so yes. we have a very personal stake in this uh, as well, but that's not where we're coming from today. I really appreciate you asking me the question. Why we're doing this, number one, it's a field of dreams to me. When my sister died, she asked me to do two things, cure breast cancer, fund research, and the second one was make sure everyone got the outcome of that. Right. And that's what I'm doing now in the last quarter of my life. And it, it's almost like the field of dreams is not, could be nightmare. We have a situation, as you know, in Palm Beach County, we're the third largest county in the third largest state with some of the worst healthcare outcomes in America. And that is because we do not have enough Medicaid and because also we have for-profit medicine and we have a very, very disadvantaged population, particularly in the west part of our county. So when I came back after all my work you know, in Washington and overseas, I said, this isn't, I can't live in a, in a state or a county like this with outcomes that are producing late stage diseases. When we know now that breast and cervical cancer can be almost 99% curable found in their earliest stages. So uh, we know that the cancer death rate is 20% higher in the state of Florida because of this, because we're not doing what we should be doing. Right. It is amazing that we have the highest rate of uninsured mm -hmm. under the from of people who are 65 and under in the entire country right. here in Florida, right. and disproportionately so in our three South Florida counties. So, you're on track to treat over 20,000 women, particularly yeah. at risk and minority women, right. with the Promise Fund, and and that's by November of this year. Right. That's that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, the the rate at which you've been able to ramp up is so important. Well, Debbie, you know, you and me, when somebody tells us it can't be done, that's like saying, please do it. Yeah. Because uh, right. she, exactly. we, we work the same way, hard all the time. Right. And when somebody told me that this couldn't be done, I said, that's it, it will be done. And I can't tell you how it has uh, consolidated our community around this issue. We have uh, 80 to 100,000 women at risk for these diseases who are essentially in the category you're talking about largely, and we have uh, cultural groups that are. And so what we did was invest in several 
patient navigators. Uh, that is, women who navigate patients who need it from their own communities. And we have paired this effort. We now have 11 uh, wonderful community navigators. And we decided to build a women's healthcare center in our federally qualified healthcare center called Found Care. Don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with the federally qualified healthcare center program. They're amazing institutions. They are, and they help treat, I think it's 60 or 70% of people in poverty around the country delivering primary care. We decided to try to stay, stay, take it just a little step farther by getting our friends at Hologic, an amazing company, donated to us a 3D mammography machine, and then we uh, have an ultrasound capability so that uh, before we started this, only maybe 16% of the people, women and men, coming in to seek screening and primary care had any breast examination at all. Now, that number is up to 60%. So with our patient navigators, who, again, who are our sweet sauce, bringing these people into the federally qualified health care center, this is our goal, Debbie. This is our goal, to have it's, one of these centers in every one of those centers. It's so important. I mean, having a trusted person mm -hmm. like a navigator, right. someone whose full-time job it is to make sure that you can put someone at ease, give them the information they need, help them make the appointment, that's critical. But the centers mm -hmm. within the FQHCs, mm -hmm. like we are starting and have now yeah. spread women's health centers in VA, facilities across mm -hmm. the country is so important because you know very often women particularly women of of different cultures right. where you know anything related to you know your breasts or you know women, women's biology is stigmatized having that center and the place they can go um, somewhat more privately is is really important too and you know you and I have discussed this before this work to me is as exciting as the web, uh, whatever that, the astro astronomers working on that who can now oh, see the, the galaxy. the web telescope. The web <laughs> telescope. I'm hoping that's what will happen, but sooner for us. But <laughs> what I think is so interesting, if you look at a historical perspective, 50 years ago, the nation uh, declared the war on cancer. And we've made tremendous gains in science and research, but we're not applying what we know. If we apply what we know, we can make most of these diseases 90 to 99 percent uh, curable and and saving the patient the agony and and the country in our health care uh, plans we can save so much of that for people who really do need end-stage care and hopefully in the future we'll need fewer and fewer of those uh, with cancer and that's why the president's moonshot yes is so and important yes can you talk a little bit about yes that? of course and dr biden i've known uh, both uh, the first lady and and president biden for 40 years i'm <laughs> marking myself with age but <laughs> they he was always a man in the center you could go to him he ted kennedy a whole host of other people who you know are not some of them not serving anymore but uh, dr biden came three weeks ago to our big program in uh, palm beach and it was absolutely incredible and talked about the moonshot program because this is one of the areas they're focusing on very tightly. How do we deliver care in a low resource environment? And the other piece that we do, Debbie, in the Promise Fund, we fund the social determinants of care. So it's not often because a woman is afraid to go to the center, it's because she doesn't have transportation. Yeah. It's because she doesn't have childcare. Right. It's because they're hungry. It's because she's gonna lose her job. So we get busy when we hear that and go right to the source and fix it right then. The all of the above approach to the, approach to the Promise Fund, to the moonshot, I mean, the moonshot is like, if you remember back to, I mean, I don't, because it was before <laughs> I was born, but to the president's vision yeah. that right. we were going to put a, a man on the moon. Right. And right. the vision that we can cure cancer and we can really make sure that we remove the obstacles right. for women to be able to be familiar enough with their what's normal for them so they know when something feels different and then when they feel different mm -hmm. then they have an opportunity relatively easily to get access to care. Yeah and the wonderful thing about the federally qualified health care centers are that they can come in a woman can come in with her child and have a whole host of vaccinations uh, early primary care people who have primary care always do better because their disease is discovered earlier and bring their children 
And this is the backbone of Care in America. The other thing, Debbie, that I think is so interesting is that, and I want to talk about the piece of legislation yeah. you're working on, but it, what, what is so interesting is that in the federally qualified health care centers, th th if you can't afford the care, you, you don't have to pay. It, if you can afford a little bit, they'll take whatever that payment is. Before we get to the PALS Act, I want to ask you about your perception that the pandemic, the impact of the COVID-19 oh. pandemic has had on access to care and the, the, the massive mountain that is now in front of us to help relieve that. Breast screening and cervical screening were down about almost 87% during COVID. A friend of mine who heads a cancer center, he said, this is like a 10 year- Overall, right? Not yeah, just overall, for women with overall. limited access. And this is a 10 year ticking time bomb. In 10 years, we may see another pandemic of exploding cancers because 10 years before they didn't find it early enough. And that's right. my greatest fear. It, it's, it's so critical because you have so many challenges that were thrown in people's way by right. the pandemic. And, you know, especially women, we always put ourselves last when it comes to health care. So having spent the last over two years not getting care mm -hmm. and making sure we can get them back into care and that that that, that obstacle is, is is set aside is is so important which which kind of leads us to yeah. the uh the, pre the, pre the protecting access to life life-saving care uh, act um i introduced after some of you may know the uh the, the there is a task force that made a decision oh. all the way back in 2009 that Unfortunately, it doesn't really have any um, cancer experts sitting on it. Right. It's called the United States Preventative Services Task Force, and they decided that women between 40 and 50 years old don't need um, to get right. a regular mammogram. Or cervical screening. And, no, you know, and no. And now even women older, fi old, between 50 and 60 um, only need it you know, every other year. Yeah. So we legislated immediately, thanks to Barbara Mikulski and the work that we did during the Affordable Care Act, and we stopped in law that from being implemented mm -hmm. because what happens is their decisions impact coverage. Insurance companies make coverage decisions based on that. And we've been needing, we, we've continually renewed it. We passed it into law. We've, we've actually included the language in the Appropriations Act. But now you have a new standard of care, digital modalities. For the women in the room, if you've had a mammogram, it's probably a 3D mammogram now. Mm -hmm. And there is not guaranteed access to insurance coverage for the most modern, comprehensive uh, mammography screening. So, and you know, talk about that a little you, bit. Thanks to you, and then putting together a bipartisan movement on yes. this with Diane Feinstein and Marsha Blackburn and yes, others I can exactly. think of, and the new right. Elmers, uh, Congress, Congresswoman Elmers. Yes. This is a new thing in our country to actually be experiencing bipartisanship now, yeah. <laughs> and, not, and lack of name calling. Thankfully. People understand this. Screening saves lives. And um, another thing, too, that I'm, I'm very proud, and, and largely, Debbie, to your leadership, and is that people are supporting these efforts more and more in, in Congress. They're, they're really looking at this. And the federally qualified health care centers get, get appropriations no matter what side you're on. Right. Because they, they, they render do. about 70 percent of poverty care in America. And this is the one thing members can agree on and not have to fight and the lobbyists don't get involved. And it, it's a blessing. We um, do have some trouble um, in states like ours, yeah. though, where we yeah. haven't expanded Medicaid, right. we're leaving a million people right. uh, you know, still uninsured. Um, if you don't have access to health care coverage, that's really a problem for your comprehensive health care needs. But because of the Affordable Care Act, access to mammography is available without a copay because yeah. it's preventative care. Um, if we stop women between 40 and 50 years old from getting access to it, then the insurance, then, then they won't have that access. And that's why it's so critical that we keep this in law. Exactly. And it's so sad in, this, in our third largest state, which now has tremendous wealth, we're not able to get more Medicaid for people. It's essential. And uh, we also uh, are getting people to understand, though, there's a charitable, very exciting opportunity for people to jump in and actually do something about this. And we have a lot of those volunteers coming back to us. They're, they don't want to work in big charities anymore. They want to work where they can see the work. And right. people, whether they're poor or whether they're wealthy, want to be treated in their own hometown. And this allows them, we aggregate services, we go to physicians, we have we are building a continuum of care for these patients. So if they are screened and they do get something, we'll see them all the way through. 
That's why building these centers in the federally qualified right. health centers is so important. I was able to uh, launch a program, the Alcy Hastings Program for Advanced Cancer Screening in Underserved Communities wow. in the Appropriations Act. I don't yeah. even think I've had a chance to talk no, to you about I'd this. No, that's wonderful. I got $5 million in the Appropriations Act Great. last year, another $5 million Great. this year, and it's specifically targeted at, at FQHCs. HRSA is yeah. issuing the first mm -hmm. grants to mm -hmm. launch the program. And we're going to be able to make sure that advanced cancer screening is available. It's already available to people who have right. co you know, comprehensive coverage, right. not so much when it comes to the people who are struggling. And then when you pre couple it, uh, as we have with these patient navigators who know these things and know how to reach out to people, and communities that become shelter places for people and, frankly, can raise money towards giving what the government's giving. Absolutely. And I want to just mention my, my dear friend, Alcee Hastings, the former yeah. congressman oh, yes. and who we named the program in honor of who lost a battle to pancreatic cancer and fought so hard Heartbreaking. to give access, to get more access to, to disadvantaged individuals who really didn't have any other place to turn. Well, when we're lucky enough to have Congress people like you Thanks. serving who look at the problems we have in this country and doing so much about it. I congratulate you and I'm grateful to you. Well, wow. very grateful I, that we live world, in a country that allows us to advocate and do the things we're doing. The world, the world owes yeah. you a tre oh. you, wow. Nancy, a tremendous <laughs> debt of gratitude, really. Thank you. Thank Making you. your life's work, honoring your Thank sister. You. The, the women's lives that you've saved across this country are, are countless. Countless. Well, you are so nice, and, and I just hope you and I get to come back on the day like the Webb Telescope. We're going to come back with something that, pretty obvious in a way, but you're verifying it, and we'll be celebrating. I can't Please wait. God. We have to keep fighting. Help us thank keep up you. the fight, my friends. Thank you so much. Nancy, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.